the cafe is titled this is claren how can we help you and we mean it we uh, would really like to know how we can help you and in order to help you we'd like you to know what claren is uh, and what we can offer for you and this session is a bit of an uh, an informal sharing of experiences and stories um, we have four speakers for you that will share their experience with claren after which we have uh, plenty of time for questions and uh, to talk about um, the possibilities of Claren. This session is interested, interesting to you if you're new to Claren uh, and you want to explore what it all can do, or if you already know Claren but you actually want to be re-familiarized um, with, uh, with all its capabilities, or uh, if you're totally a Claren addict and you just can't miss out on this one session as well. Uh, it's great to have you all here, regardless of the reason that you're here. I want to just briefly explain the structure. We have four speakers for you. They will each highlight uh, a, a separate part of Claren. Uh, and after that, we will have questions. So not per speaker, but at the end. Our first speaker is none other than uh, Steven Krauer himself, co-founder of Claren and uh, the first executive director there was a prize, an award named after him, uh, but the man is still super alive, healthy and well, uh, and he's here to tell you all about Claren, um, about the dream that uh, was at the foundation of it. Steven, the floor is yours. Go ahead. I've only got a few minutes, but I want to share with you the, the what I call the Claren dream, as we saw it in, in uh, 2005, because we wanted to create a whole web of centers all over Europe that would give seamless access to data, tools, and expertise. That was the dream. And now, if you look at 2020, you see you see the map of Europe. Uh, the, 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 you see that we have the, the, the colors of the map. You may have seen the map before. Uh, indicate the, the degree of involvement in Clarion of the various countries. The darker, do the more involved as full members. Uh, the dots are the centers that provide data tools and uh, expertise. And I must admit that this uh, map is not quite up to date. I think I used uh, last year's map. So in the meantime, we have uh, received many more uh, centers that have been added to, to Clarion. So this is just a, a bit old fashioned picture. So don't feel offended if your center is not uh, listed here. But in the next version of the map, you will see it. Now, what was the dream in concrete terms? We wanted, for example, to enable a humanities researcher in Austria, just an arbitrary country, to, to consult the Claren catalog where we list all our resources, and then uh, where he or she would be able to find relevant text collections, for example, in Sweden, Belarus, and the United States. All these countries are involved in, in, uh, in Clarion. And uh, the person could find a semantic lexicon in Italy, for example, and a semantic annotation tool in Germany. This is just a fictitious example, of course, but just to show what we had in mind. And uh, this person could use these ingredients to build a semantically annotated version of the text collections that uh, the, he or she started with. And there, he or she could benefit from the Clarion interoperability standards that ensure that things fit together, that things can work together. Then, uh, then the next step is the most important one in the life of this research, of course, because then the real work starts, performing the research, answering the research question, and during this work, uh, the person could also still uh, make use of our centers of expertise, for example, one in Spain that may have done similar things, and of course, the person should also keep in mind what our invited speaker just told us to check very carefully whether the, the, the semantically annotated uh, material uh, that was created really matches with the research question uh, to be answered. Otherwise, it becomes a very uh, hopeless exercise. And then when the results are there, the annotated text collection uh, can be deposited in a repository in, for example, Bulgaria, to make sure it can uh, be used by others. And all this should be able, uh, should be possible from his or, 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 or her own desk. And that was the challenge. And I think we've already gotten quite far if you, uh, and you will see that if you attend today's conference. Then the question is, for whom are we doing all this work? 
many people say, well, Clarion is a nice toy for the linguists, but uh, I'm not a linguist, so I'm not interested. But look here, language is everywhere, not just in the dreams of linguists and of language teachers. It plays a very important role in many, many disciplines, and Clarion have, has the ambition to serve them all. And on the next slide, I will show some examples of the roles that language plays and the audiences that could benefit from Clarion. And in the rest of the Clarion Cafe, you will see some exciting examples, real life examples. Now, if we look at the roles of language and the corresponding audiences, you will see that uh, language is a carrier of cultural content. So it's relevant for cultural heritage studies. It, is, it uh, gives records of the past. So it's important for archeology span or history. It is the main communication instrument within and uh, across societies. So it's relevant for sociology, anthropology. These are just examples of course, there are far more. It is used to preserve and disseminate knowledge. So that's relevant for all disciplines without exception. It's an in instrument to formulate rules for society. So let's say law, theology. It's a carrier of information from person to person. So it's rel relevant for media studies and journalism. It is a means of human expression. Think of literary studies, art, psychology. It's a focus of cognitive processes, brain studies, psychology, neuro neurology. It's a component of our national or cultural identity. So it's relevant for political sciences, for social sciences. It is of course an object of study. That's where the, the linguists come in. The, so it's interesting for linguistics and for language learning. And my last example, it's an object of computer processing. So that's uh, language and speech technology. And many of you have a background in that. So this is just to, to show how important language is and how many communities can be served by claim. And now my, of course, I don't want to give the impression that even if I was the first director, I've done it all by, uh, by myself on my own. Um, here you see a uh, part of the Clarion Dream Team at work. It was in the year 10 before Zoom, so in 2010. And at that time, it was still legal to sit together, have a glass of wine together and uh, think about the deep Clarion questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, great to uh, hear this story and all the dreams and ambitions that Clarion had and still has. Uh, we're still looking forward to uh, sharing this dream with more uh, people. And that's also why we have this cafe. Um, maybe you're a neurologist, maybe you're a media studies, maybe you're in journalism. Uh, those resources can also be there for you. Uh, and to show a few examples of the many different fields uh, that uh, Claren can work in, we have um, three people here for you that can uh, tell you their story. The first one is uh, Susanna Nulundskog. Uh, she's an ethnologist and folklore researcher in Sweden and Finland. Uh, and uh, she will tell you how uh, she's connected to the, I believe, the Swed Swedish uh, branch of Clarin. So uh, go ahead, Suzanne. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. And it was so interesting to hear this first uh, short uh, speech. Um, so I'm a researcher at the Institute uh, for Language and Folklore. And that is a Swedish government agency with archives that, amongst other things, uh, holds something like 20, uh, 25,000 hours of recorded speech. The recordings are heterogeneous, uh, uh, representing a multitude of speakers, topics, genres, and localities, as well as physically reflecting changing recording techniques over the years. The audio material uh, represents an enormously rich resource uh, for research of many kinds. Uh, however, uh, they are sadly underutilized, um, at least for the humanities and the social sciences purposes, uh, where researchers often only work with secondary materials, uh, such as transcriptions of the spoken materials, instead of investigating the recordings themselves. Uh, this is mainly because of the lack of convenient ways of locating and accessing audio content. The recordings have to be played in real time to be analyzed, and to listen once to all of the digitized recordings in our archives would take more than six years if you were to listen five days a week, eight hours a day. Uh, if you were to comment, the time estimate would at least double. 
and for transcribing the recordings, the total estimate is somewhere between 250 and 600 working years. So in other words, uh, speech is extremely challenging and time consuming to work with and can be quite unmanageable without appropriate tools. So this is what we try to come to terms with in the multidisciplinary project Tiltal, uh, where the overall goal is to make Sweden's archive of recorded speech more accessible for humanities and social science research, which is also the main goal of the Swedish K Center. So I'm involved in this project uh, as a qualitative researcher specialized in narratives and storytelling. And I study the recordings and collaborate with language technologists who help me with technological solutions for my research questions. Um, just recently, I was conducting research on an audio recording that was made in the 1960s with a Swedish American called Carl Nelson. He came to America in 1896 and when he was 18 years old. So what is interesting about the interview is that in certain parts, uh, Nelson repeats the same folk stories that he had already described in written correspondence. Additionally, Nelson uh, often jumps from one story to another and then later on returns to the comment on a story he's already told. Aside from Nelson's rather messy narration with frequent digressions, the recording is 10 hours long in total, so it took me weeks to go through it. You see some of the linked material here to Nelson's recording. Automatic speech recognition, uh, RS, ASR, has developed rapidly in recent years, as you all know, but it's still a long way from managing heavily uh, non-standard speech, such as Con Nelson's. In other words, the vast majority of the audio materials cannot be searched directly. And one big obstacle to using the audio collections, therefore, is how to locate portions of interest. And the obvious answer is text, any note, uh, any notes, summaries, transcriptions, subject topics, in the indices, recording logs, etc., with uh, references to content. Uh, constitute potential keys to opening uh, this treasure of recording. Um, one outcome of analyzing the archival uh, structures from the point of view of improving access to audio recordings uh, that we have developed in Tiltal is the concept that we call bunches. The idea is for each recording uh, to be linked to all its related documents and any other relevant item in the collections uh, and perhaps beyond into virtual bunches. Here you see at the center of the slide, you can see an illustration of the recording and all connected, uh, possible connected material. Uh, so uh, what we want to, to work on is accessing any of the component parts would bring up the others, including things like correspondence uh, or a photo of the speaker. Uh, taking together bunches in a way similar to linked data or data, uh, form a multi-dimensional networks of archival records encoded for their various properties and their relations to other records. So to conclude, the concept of bunches implemented in the rich digital research environment with its tools promise exciting advances in the research methods available in an archival setting. They could not have come about without the intense focus on cross-disciplinary exchange of methods and ideas implemented in the Tiltal project, the K-Center, and in co collaboration with the National Language Bank and SWE Claren. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, mm. Suzanne. Great insight in uh, an another field where uh, Claren tools are used, in this case, to just access the vast amount of data that is there. Um, our next speaker is Christian Alderson. Uh, he works at Utrecht University in the Department of uh, Media Studies and Culture, and uh, he will share his story for you now. Yes, yeah, so uh, it, it may not be, I mean, multimedia is also a really important part of Clarin, and it may not be common knowledge to everyone here that the technologies developed and explored within Clarin also play a great role in analyzing 
not only speech and text data, but also moving image data. Uh, in fact, here in the Netherlands, uh, every day it helps lecturers, students and researchers in accessing uh, thousands of hours of television, film and related materials um, in a combined uh, mixed uh, method approach. Uh, this is something I'm working on uh, in uh, the context of the Dutch Claria Media Suite project uh, that you can see um, an example of uh, the interface here on the slide, which is an infrastructure project in which we uh, develop, uh, we, we unlock collections for uh, researchers in the Netherlands uh, and also develop tutorials that they can use um, in their teaching. Um, based on, on these collections. Um, and my principal task is to ensure that users can access and analyze materials coming from a very wide variety of, of collections uh, that also contain various, very different collection types. So for instance, we work very closely with the iFilm Museum, the Netherlands Institute for Sound and Vision, um, that hold and make available both uh, audiovisual materials, but also uh, digitized uh, documents, for instance. Um, and this is a very complex task uh, in the sense that the interests we cater to are widely diverging. Some of our users may be purely interested, for instance, in the speech contained in uh, audiovisual materials and may find that uh, satisfactory as an entry point, whereas for others, uh, they're just as interested, for instance, in the visual features of an image, for instance, for the purpose of uh, aesthetic analysis uh, or political uh, representation analysis. Um, so it's it's the, the environment that we have uh, has to be multimodal, multimedia, and has to have this interaction of, of text and, and moving image data. Um, and what we've specifically been doing in order to open up these collections and make sure, making sure that that um, researchers, teachers, and students can access them is that we've combined uh, various methods. So. Uh, we rely very strongly on the one hand on language processing tools um, in combination with moving image analysis tools. Um, uh, for the latter, we use both uh, qualitative and quantitative moving image analysis tools. Uh, to give an example, um, one very complex collection that we've worked with in the context of this project is the Dismet collection. Um, this is a complex collection that consists of silent films, uh, primarily from the early teens, uh, as well as a base personal business archive um, left behind by cinema distributor uh, Jean Desmet. This is a very uh, important collection for, for media historical research in the Netherlands, but also um, internationally. Uh, and it's, it's used especially in film history teaching, um, uh, both for aesthetic, but also social uh, socioeconomic history. Uh, and what we've done, for instance, is that we've used, uh, we've done a lot of text analysis of written documents simply uh, for the sake of being able to find connection points between film materials, for instance, if you want to just to, 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 to analyze the distribution of films, uh, but also just to find contextual information on films. And uh, all of the data that we can pull out of the, uh, the documents uh, become sort of an entry point uh, for studying the moving images. Uh, a bit as, as in the presentation of Susanna that we just saw, uh, you can use this to make connections and you can also use that as, as a departure point for making your own segments in films and create um, units uh, that interest you. Uh, we've done uh, quite um, quite advanced things as well, more advanced things, I would say, for uh, the, the archive of the public broadcast corporations that are also made available in the, in the Claria uh, media suite. Specifically, we've performed ASR uh, on, on the entire, uh, the, all, all of the materials that we have. Uh, so really it's thousands of hours of television and, and radio broadcasts, uh, which has worked really, really well that we, after that have been able to, to make available within the media suite, it can be searched, um, uh, the materials, and you can, based on that, uh, link materials, uh, and also, again, uh, use that for as an entry point for qualitative analysis research um, within your own work environment, linking it to the, the sources that you would like to add to it. Um, so using these tools in combination, both um, video uh, annotation and also ASR, as well as, as, as various other text, text analysis tools, we've been able to um, actually facilitate this multimedia, multimodal research that ideally we would like uh, students and teachers to engage with. Um, and we're still working on this. If you're interested, 
uh, we've recently uh, launched a, 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 a learn page for the Clio Media Suite where we're beginning to upload tutorials um, that, that show how we work with them uh, practically in teaching. A very strong focus in these tutorials have been to also stimulate a critical thinking about how uh, students and researchers access these sources. So really inviting them to think about how you can use uh, both text and audiovisual data as different entry points uh, into the beginning into beginning a research process thanks thank you christian we have one more speaker to go um, that is noemi vadaj uh, she is from uh, hungary a linguistics researcher and um, she will tell us more about her work on anaphora coreference resolution uh, and is she already visible noemi there she is great uh, i give you the word thank you uh, so thank you for introducing me. Mm, last year I participated in uh, the annual Clarion Conference in Leipzig, uh, but I was expecting my son by then, and I wouldn't thought that I can participate this year as well, but thanks to the virus I could. Uh, so firstly, some words about the text processing tool for Hungarian, e Magyar. It is connected to Hung Clarin, uh, so it is a part of the Clarin infrastructure. And um, I've used the uh, MAGYAR in an important part of my PhD work, uh, Corpus Building Project. Uh, very briefly, my PhD topic is Anapora and uh, Coreference, uh, as Ben said. And in this project, I've built a small Hungarian coreference corpus called uh, CORCOR. And uh, I have published not only the corpus itself, but the whole uh, workflow and all the scripts, guidelines, and uh, everything I used during the project as well, hoping that it's going to be useful for others. And this corpus contains uh, multiple annotation layers uh, next to anaphora and coreference, uh, part of speech text, morphological text, uh, lemmata, and dependency parsing as well. And all of these layers were uh, manually corrected. Uh, so I used the uh, uh, in this uh, corpus building project, uh, like I said. Um, and the uh, Magyar is a modular um, uh, tool. And thanks to the clear documentation, one can uh, simply create and add further modules to uh, Magyar. Um, I've used the inner modules as well. But for my special purposes, I had to write some new modules as well. So I wrote scripts, and they were uh, given to, to the Amador infrastructure as new modules. Uh, I've uh, written um, a module that converts between morphological text sets, um, one for a conversion between output formats, and one for inserting dropped pronouns. Um, and this latter one is needed for an upper resolution uh, because uh, Hungarian is a pro-drop language. So uh, these covert elements uh, take a crucial part uh, in the play of an upper relations. And additionally, I've written a simple script for comparing texts uh, of the proper format, uh, and it can be used for investigating the differences between the texts uh, by the annotation layers and for evaluation with the traditional metrics and uh, for calculating inter annotator agreement as well for certain layers. So these scripts were very useful for my project and it turned out soon that they fit well into the Magyar infrastructure. So they have became, became um, modules as well. So uh, from a simple user of Magyar, I became a member of the developer team uh, by this. Um, if you're interested in uh, MIR, you can find some more information about the modules and the usage on GitHub, and I send you another link to this. Mm. Getting useful tools and resources uh, help a lot uh, during a PhD project, uh, but the other side of the coin is uh, presenting your work. And I think that uh, Clarin events and com community uh, provide a great opportunity to show yourself and I'd like to share with you some good memories of some Clarin events, uh, which I've participated. Uh, first of all, uh, Hun Clarin has organized uh, three roadshow events to support humanities and social science research uh, with uh, language technologies and resources and tools. And now I send you another link to these events. You can 
read more about it, but in a few words, uh, these events were organized in universities, uh, in three universities, addressing uh, not only students, but teachers and researchers as well. And in these workshops, the audience could uh, get to know uh, the clarin infrastructure itself and some tools and resources belonging to it. And in the second part of uh, these uh, workshops, um, the local colleagues uh, had the opportunity to show themselves, to share their experiences with these tools and resources. And uh, due to the workshop style of these events, uh, they could get instant feedback as well. And in two of these uh, three workshops, uh, I had the opportunity to present a major and introduce the audience to how to use it and uh, to uh, what to use it for and so on. And one of the hosts uh, were the University of Pech, where I've got my bachelor degree. So it was really inspiring me uh, for me to think and work together uh, with the teachers from who I first learned linguistics. Another Clarin event, uh, which I'd like to call up, uh, was a workshop uh, last year on NLP tools for historical documents in Berlin. And now I send you another link. Mm. I brought there a normalization tool, which were used for normalizing old Hungarian texts. And uh, this event gave me a chance to uh, get to know other researchers of this very specific field. And uh, thanks to the interactive style uh, of this workshop, uh, everyone got time to give a comment, uh, a useful advice, or to ask questions. And uh, from this event, I got uh, self-confidence and courage because um, every participant uh, got the same helpful attention, uh, whether being uh, well-experienced, uh, expert of the topic or a very new uh, person to the field. So to sum up, um, these Clarion conferences and workshops and events uh, serve uh, as a good platform to share new ideas to colleagues uh, with more experience and get useful feedback. And it was really important. It is really important for me. Um, even if uh, conferencing and networking has this totally new form nowadays, uh, when anyone can connect uh, to a conference uh, from his or her living room, including um, me with an eight months old son uh, behind me. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Noemi. Any questions for any of our speakers? You've heard four people get, shared their perspective on Claren. What would your advice to a complete newcomer be? A question by Daria Fischer. Uh, and I'm going to forward this question to Steven uh, as uh, Eminence Grise of the field. A complete newcomer in Clarin now, like uh, um, Noemi was a few years ago. Um, what would your advice be, Steven? Well, it depends a bit on what sort of newcomer you are, because if you're a newcomer in, let's say, in Germany, my advice would always be just to contact the German National uh, Clearing Consortium because that's full of uh, facilities, uh, knowledge, expertise, resources, etc. But um, if, for example, you're from a country that's not connected to, to clearing yet, then I think one of the best first steps would be to, uh, to attend this conference. In the breakout session, I just met the first uh, Bosnian Herzegovina uh, citizen I've ever seen. And that, uh, so it means that also from that country, there's interest in joining Claring. And I just told her uh, that she should try to, to contact as many people as possible here and try to, to see how she can use these contacts to try to establish a Claring community in her own country. Ah, great. But these are very different cases, of course. Yeah. I will also ask Noemi for your uh, perspective. This is very still quite recent for you. Uh, what would your uh, advice be? Uh, yes, uh, my advice would be to gain some information from the web page, from the Clarion web page, uh, as I have sent you some links about uh, former events and uh, tools. Uh, one can gain early um, uh, useful information from these um, pages. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. 
Uh, if any of the other speakers want to react, just give me a hand signal so I give you the word, uh, of course. Uh, I'm inviting people to ask more questions if they have any. Um, otherwise, uh, uh, Stephen. Just another suggestion, because what I always tell people who um, don't know exactly how they can use whatever Clarion has to offer in their own research, I always recommend to them to uh, look at examples. Just look to uh, look at the descriptions of existing use cases where people who are working in a similar field or field or who are doing similar things see how they solve their problems. Because very mm -hmm. often, you know, I always tell people that um, researchers are to a large extent uh, imitators. They want to imitate the good examples that other people have given them and apply it to their own work. So looking at inspiring examples is much better than, let's say, starting out with uh, doing a course in programming. Yeah, yeah. And uh, inspiring I, I think, examples. I think, Stephen, we can refer them to the uh, publication Stour de Clarin, uh, where a bunch of interviews and also examples of uh, resources and use of resource are being described. Yeah. Uh, and uh, many of the uh, languages and countries of Clarin have already been covered in there. So. Uh, that's definitely uh, an interesting um, place to start. Yeah. And Daria is sharing links in the chat, so be sure to check them. Um, they are good places to check uh, for starting points. Um, Suzanne, I believe we had, uh, we, I've had preparatory talks with all of these speakers. Um, and uh, so you told me uh, about the bunch uh, of uh, information that you uh, also presented now in the chat uh, uh, in, in your uh, um, talk. Uh, and I'm, because you mentioned it to me, of course, it's a, it's a funny, um, funny word to, to use. <laughs> so I'm, I'm wondering where does it uh, originate? Who started the bunch? Oh. <laughs> We were sitting down actually in the group when we we were trying to. It took actually to to, to just step back, uh, take a step back. And when we started to work in this project, we came from all over the place. We have so uh, very different backgrounds. So it took us longer than we had ex previously expected to to sort of work together. But during one of these sessions, when we tried to get to know the material, get to know the archives, get to know the different disciplines, backgrounds and everything, we, would, we were trying to find a word that wasn't used before so that it wouldn't be mis mistaken with words like collection can mean many, many things or data can mean many things. Mm -hmm. So we tried a word that was more of a word that no one else would use <laughs> mainly uh, to describe what we were doing. Uh, but as a techni um, technician or a language technician told me recently, it is very similar to what you um, would call uh, linked data. Um, what we're trying to do, but yes. what we, what I understand we do differently is that we put the recording at the center of this. Uh, so we, the, what we want our sort of future aim is to get people to access the recordings and don't stop at the, uh, some other material that actually listen. And uh, that would be the dream scenario for us. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Um, Christian, I, uh, I don't see any more questions in the chat, so I'm going to just ask what I think it is interesting, uh, because I saw in your bio that you were a, um, a resident scholar in the film museum, uh, and I'm just so interested in uh, what does a resident scholar in that museum do? Yeah, uh, that's that's true. I mean, that it was um, it's it's part, it was part of a new program that the film museum uh, started a few years back, where they every year invite a scholar and an artist to uh, go into a part of their collection. Uh, you know, you choose a part of the collection of your own choice, uh, and make an original study based on that. And for me, that was actually an opportunity to do everything that I do not do in the Clia context, because there I work mainly with digitized collections and try to see how uh, they can be meaningfully integrated in teaching, but also research more broadly. Uh, so what I did specifically in that context was to go into a part of, of ICE, um, uh, 
business archives, the early business archives, to see what their, their um, uh, early acquisition policies were um, in terms of acquiring films that could be used in teaching. <laughs> so, so in that sense, there was a, a similar uh, focus point. But there I looked then at specifically, you know, uh, compilation films that showed the development of film history uh, and, and how they, you know, reflect the different rhetorics uh, of film history at a very early stage. Um, so that was actually specifically what I did. And I must say it also gave me a much better sense of uh, these different collections that we also have in the media suite because um, for many years I only saw all of these papers digitized and, you know, uh, facilitated uh, research on them with very advanced tools that, you know, you don't have when you do it the old way, so to say. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, I want to, it's actually a question for, uh, for all of you. Um, how, like, what would your advice be for the current existing Clarin centers in, in each of the countries? Um, how can we be more uh, approachable for new researchers that have um, interesting research questions, uh, possibly for PhD uh, students? Um, how can the centers um, be more open to help them or to collaborate or advise them? I'm going to give it to you, Suzanne, because you're smiling so much. You must have something positive to say. Oh, I'm actually, I have no definite answer to that, but I'm thinking, I, I, I remember in the beginning when when I and many with me weren't that used to computers <laughs> or teaching him by computers. Uh, and uh, when I found somebody that was uh, the link, a person that was the link between uh, everybody that worked with building computers and, and people like me, myself. And then he, he just said, what do you want to have on your table? What do you want on your screen? What do you want to do with your computer? And then he sort of simplified my work enormously. And I'm thinking sometimes that you would need a guide. <laughs> Uh, there would be guides sort of employed part time at the different centers that would sort of, uh, once you approach them, they would sort of guide you around. This is what you can offer. But because the more I learn about the, the Swedish uh, work, I, I see that there are enormous resources that I didn't know about. And uh, still, I'm a little bit involved in comparison to people that are not involved at all. So perhaps a guide <laughs> yeah a guide yeah, I don't, and yeah. um I, I think i remember also from our uh, previous talk is that as a non uh, non-language researcher or not a computational linguist it could be hard to start being involved because the vocabulary for example is completely different between natural language processing or, or computational linguistics the people developing uh, the tools and the users uh, you speak of, uh, in your uh, fields, also uh, Christian, uh, you speak of archives of, uh, um, while data can mean anything, which is why you have uh, your bunch of information. Uh, so I'm wondering what the other speakers uh, think of um, uh, approachability in the sense of um, uh, openness to new fields and um, uh, and, and especially then in uh, how we talk about it or how we uh, present ourselves. Stephen. Yeah, well, I think you already mentioned a very important point that is that normally people from different disciplines, be it, let's say a literary scholar and, uh, and a digital expert, they don't speak the same language. So it's very important that they, first of all, realize that they speak different languages. And secondly, that they try to develop a common language or so a common, communication platform where they both understand what the other person can offer but also also what his or her constraints are so that it's quite clear so that you don't have false expectations because that's very often a problem that people um, have wrong expectations of let's say using digital tools and that's a very very important point because i think very often uh, managing a project of this type where the digital and the humanities meet is um, also a matter of managing expectations. Mm -hmm. So that we all have the same expectation. And I think uh, uh, Daria put in the chat uh, a reference to a, uh, an upcoming uh, workshop, a twin talks workshop. 
And uh, that is exactly dedicated to the problem of uh, how do people from the humanities and from the digital side collaborate on the work floor? What can you do in their education in order to facilitate this, to, to make it easier? So that is, uh, I, I find it an exciting topic and uh, I hope that many people will contribute to that workshop and also will come mm -hmm. up with new ideas. Yeah, and I think the keynote that we had from uh, Ansk Focus is also very related, not in the sense per se of jargon, but also in understanding the methodology and knowing what you can or cannot do, um, which we need the NLP people uh, for uh, to, to uh, have a check on that. Uh, there's a question in the chat from Go. I understand there are many Clarin related projects using a single language, resources and tools from a single country, but they wonder if there are projects which use multiple languages uh, and tools from different countries. I think Suzanne wants to react. Great. No, good. Go ahead. I, I, I could men mention a project uh, uh, that is connected to SWE Clarin that is actually different languages, but uh, it's not a language project per se. It is a, is a project on, on um, tales, actually, and it's uh, building up a knowledge base of, on, on uh, Nordic tales, and that is from all the Nordic countries and hmm. beyond. Okay. Uh, so it's a it's a common database and it's a search uh, uh, you search on a map sort of a, a, a digital map for all these tales. Cool. So that involves different languages and there is some translation and difficulties of course. Uh, but since we're not working with it on in language per se, it's it's easier to to handle. Yeah. Uh, if you understand. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, then for now, I would like to close this session. Thank you for coming to the... Ah, Steven, you still have Just to... a very brief comment, because um, I'm also very much interested in, let's say, uh, cross-language research and comparative research. And I hope that the fact that we have established, with the help of Daria Fischer, is the families of... Uh, uh, the language resources families, mm -hmm. in Ukraine, which is families of similar, uh, uh, let's say, data collections that exist in different languages, like newspapers, parliamentary records, etc., etc. And I would hope that these uh, resources invite to uh, cross-country, cross-language uh, uh, collaboration. So we should also really try to promote them as such, because I think that uh, Clarin should not be a collection of, let's say, isolated groups in countries who are just doing whatever they mm -hmm. did before, but just under a big umbrella. It, the, the new situation, the big umbrella should also really, uh, uh, let's say, support and facilitate collaboration across languages and across countries. Great. Yeah, yeah I completely agree. Uh, I think, uh, Stephen, is that um, you, you mentioned the uh, uh, Clarin 2005 dream. What is your Clarin 2025 dream? Well, that's, that's interesting. Uh, well, first of all, I hope that um, the that a number of obstacles will uh, have disappeared because I think in our whole field, one enormous obstacle is it's a very boring topic, but it's intellectual property rights. Because, for example, if a researcher just uh, digitizes a novel and annotates it in a wonderful manner, very useful for the whole community, then the person is not allowed to share it with the rest of the community because the owner of the novel. Uh, would hardly give uh, his permission for that. So I think, I hope that by 2025, 20, uh, uh, people, the legislators will have realized that this is really a very important obstacle. And the second thing is that uh, by then it will be much more normal to uh, collaborate in, in teams, in, in let's say cross-border teams, because until now, if you look at the, the humanities, you still see that it's a solo endeavor. Many people do their own research on their own. And uh, I think the, the challenges in our field are enormous if you really want to do good work. And uh, enormous challenges require teams to do the work. And that is very important. And we should also try yeah. to encourage that in Clarin. And not Microsoft Teams, but actual teams of people <laughs> really? collaborating, preferably physically together Absolutely. in a room yeah. without yeah. health issues. Yes, I uh, completely agree. Uh, we're going to wrap up the Clarin Cafe here.